The Stuka, a name that brought dread and fear to hundreds of thousands as it ushered in the Second World War. With sirens shrieking, it dived to deliver death and destruction, quickly becoming a potent symbol of Blitzkrieg. Although an effective weapon of terror, the Stuka had serious design flaws. The Ju-87 Stuka had its origins in an earlier design by the Junkers company. The model K-47 was built in 1927 as a civilian aircraft at a time when Germany was prohibited from making military planes. Later it was converted to a rugged two-seat fighter with a rare gunner able to fire between its twin rudders. Over time, the K-47 developed into a prototype dive bomber. From these tests, the concept for the Stuka was to emerge. However, the Stuka was not Germany's first dive bomber. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, they quickly rearmed the Luftwaffe by transforming the Heinkel 50 and the Henschel 123 into dive bombers. The modifications to the 123 proved to be much more than just a short-term fix. This formidable biplane provided effective close support and dive bombing service across Europe until 1944. The very first Stuka produced was made in secret at the Junkers factory in Sweden. But the Stuka's introduction to service was held up by problems in development. Hermann Pohlmann, Stuka's designer, had also worked on the K-47 and he chose to adopt much of the earlier aircraft's layout, including its twin rudder tailplane. But the Ju-87's weight and diving requirements were much greater than the K-47. On the 24th of January 1936, the prototype Stuka crashed in a dive when the entire tailplane simply broke off. The crash killed the test pilot and his engineer. The accident left Pullman with little choice but to modify the tail. Accurate bobbing required diving vertically. The twin fins and rudders were simply too weak to withstand the strong forces during a dive. Pullman's solution was to change to a stronger single rudder. But this created another problem. The vertical stabilizer greatly reduced the rear gunner's field of fire. The Junkers 87 double fin layout had failed, and the tail had already gone through one major transition, which in many ways was a step backwards, at least as far as the plane's defense was concerned. Other ideas like a rudder that could slide clear in flight were tested. This at least would have left the rear gunner with an unrestricted field of fire. The final solution came when an innovative rotating rudder was developed. However, this also meant major modifications to the fuselage. The Stuka's shortcomings forced Junkers to go back to the drawing board. This time, they proposed a totally new Super Stuka with an advanced fire control system using an optical gun sight and cannons that would keep any fighter at bay. However, all this innovation would require a complete retooling of the factory and disruption of the existing production line. Well, as I, my feeling is that there were too many innovations involved in this aircraft and not very effective ones. In fact, one might say there were, there were minuses rather than pluses. Uh, they, to give the rear gunner a better field of fire by dropping the tail was a very small plus because um, there really well, it was an, an ineffective defensive situation anyway in the Stuka. Very small caliber guns uh, with one gunner in the back. To retract the undercarriage was to remove one of the main drag factors in the dive of this aircraft. And this was a, a very important factor, the fact that the undercarriage did give such drag because that did stop acceleration in the dive 
and that gives you more time for aiming, better accuracy, and altogether it's, you were removing one of the pluses and putting a minus in its place. These things have their pros and their cons, because the Stuka really, even with an open field of fire, was not very defensible. So it's a matter of weighing up pros and cons, and in this case, I believe the cons outweighed the pros, frankly. There were other considerations too. By the end of 1941, the Luftwaffe had a much stronger day fighter than the BF-109. The new fighter was the Fokker Wolf 190. The 190 was also strong enough to accurately deliver a bomb, at least in a moderate dive. Since the new fighter now shared dive bombing duties, the Stuka had to soldier on in its original form. However, it was also given a new role where it was to excel. After Germany's abortive attack against Russia, the Eastern Front became very much a tank war. With the Henschel 129, the Luftwaffe did have a specialist anti-tank plane, but there were never enough of them. The HS 129 was heavily armored to provide good pilot protection, but the aircraft was underpowered, a factor that endangered its entire mission. So Stuka's support for the anti-tank role was timely. So the Junkers Ju87 was pressed into service and became a very effective tank buster. Other jobs included transport missions where the venerable Stuka performed the duty of a communications vehicle taking staff and supplies to the front line. On the return trip, it was often used to ferry wounded soldiers in a gondola set on top of each wing. In the bitter cold of a winter on the Russian front, these converted dive bombers must have been a welcome sight, although their story is little known. Equally unknown is the role that Stukas would have played had Hitler's only aircraft carrier, the Zeppelin, ever put to sea. Experienced Luftwaffe pilots had warned that if Stukas were attacked and forced to ditch in the sea, there would be serious problems. As their fixed undercarriage hit the water, the plane was likely to cartwheel. Junker's solution was to use explosive bolts to jettison the landing gear, permitting a much safer ditching on water. The Stuka didn't just stay in service until the war ended, it also stayed in production. Over 6,500 were built before the last one was pushed off the production line, probably cobbled together from damaged or spare parts. Despite the large numbers produced, only a handful of Ju-87s have been found. But the terror they created still remains seared in the minds of survivors. When he's diving steady at you, you, you see the pilot, and, and you are pretty sure that therefore he can see you as well, you see. And, and, of, and you think, oh my God, he's, 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 he, he finished me off. And he was diving at you, you had a feeling he's bound to get you. <laughs> You, you know, and all, even in the First World War, people, shall we say, fighter pilots just attack and fire machine guns at people and so on. This you can hide. You can hide behind a wall, you can hide behind a ditch, you can hide behind a tree. You can't hide from a bomb, because a bomb will destroy the wall. And it's really and truly frightening. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, Thank you for watching.